This is 3.6 Simplicit Differentiation Part 2, Content Objective 2, which is to differentiate the inverse trig functions. When we're done, I'd like you to write a memory trick to help you remember the derivatives of the inverse trig functions because, again, just like in Section 3.4, you're going to have to memorize these derivative rules so that you can use them without having any cheat sheets. So to start with, we're going to develop, and the reason I'm going to do this is because if you can't remember in a pinch, I want you to be able to understand the development so that you can create these rules on your own. So for first, the first one, and notice I have these written in your notes, but I'm going to go through them so that you can actually see where it comes from. On our first one, we have this derivative of, or this rule, y equals the sine inverse of x, and we want to find its derivatives. So I have two options available to me. I can backtrack to the definition of the derivative and do that limit as h approaches 0 of the sine inverse of x plus h minus the sine inverse of x over h and try to find that limit as h approaches 0 or I can rewrite this using trig functions and then take derivatives of this using the shortcut rules that I've already learned. And I'm going to opt for option 2 because it's much simpler. So we should remember that if I sign both sides of this equation that the sine and sine inverse undo each other, so I'll be left with the sine of y equals a simple x. And now that I have this, I can find the derivative using implicit differentiation and the old techniques that we've practiced in this section already. So if I apply that ddx operator to both the sine of y and to x, I will get... the cosine of y times dy dx equaling 1. Because dy dx shows up just one time, I can isolate it and get dy dx equals 1 over the cosine of y. So technically this is correct. However, if you go look up in your textbook for the derivative of sine inverse of x, they do not tell you 1 over cosine of y. So the first thing we're going to do to get toward what the, what the book gives us is we're going to replace y with what it equals. When we take the derivatives of things involving x's, we want to end up with things involving x's. So that would give me a 1 over a cosine of a sine inverse of x. So again, technically this is correct. However, it's not going to match anything that you've run into on a multiple choice problem. So we have to somehow rewrite this in a way that we can use the rules that are given to us in the book. So to get there, we're going to think about what that statement actually says. If I want cosine of sine inverse of x, this is asking us for the cosine of the angle whose sine is equal to x. And if we remember our old geometry rules when we first started right triangle trig, we know that an angle sine in a right triangle is computed by doing the opposite over the hypotenuse. So if we want that angle to have a sine of x over 1, that's telling us essentially that the ratio between the opposite side and the hypotenuse is going to be x over 1. Now we're interested in the cosine of that angle, so the cosine requires the adjacent side over 1. So if I use my Pythagorean theorem and realize or remember that a leg squared plus a leg squared equals the hypotenuse squared, then I can figure out pretty quickly that this is going to be the square root of a 1 minus x squared. So the cosine will be this adjacent side, which is the square root of 1 minus x squared, over the hypotenuse, which is 1. So I can rewrite that dy dx, which is the same as the derivative of the sine inverse of x, as 1 over the cosine of that angle. So this is the rule that we will see and that we will use repeatedly. And once we have this rule, we also need to pay attention to what the domain of that derivative is going to be because we want to know when is this thing differentiable for what values of x. Well, we know from our old domain rules that the inside of the radical has to be positive and we know that the bottom of a denominator or the bottom of a fraction cannot be 0. So that means a 1 minus x squared has to be beta greater than 0, 
or that 1 has to be bigger than x squared, or that x has to be trapped between negative 1 and 1. So this is the domain for which the original function is differentiable. So let's look at a picture to kind of see where that would come from and why that works. If we go back and look at our picture, we can see here I drew the black cos or excuse me, the black sine curve. And then remember that the sine curve itself fails that horizontal line test. So in order to get an inverse sine, we had to restrict the domain to a negative pi over 2 to a positive pi over 2. So this red function is now our original sine function with a restricted domain. Once we've re we have restricted the domain, then we can flip over this line y equals x and we can get the inverse function which is this blue one. So the inverse sign is going to look like this blue curve here. Now if we notice on the original sign, we're going to have horizontal tangent lines at that pi over 2. So that means when we flip, we're going to have vertical tangent lines at 1 and at negative 1. So vertical tangent lines have undefined slope. So that means the derivative at negative 1 and 1 is going to be undefined. We can also see that we only get sine inverse curve between negative 1 and 1. So looking at it graphically, we can verify that the domain of this sine inverse function's derivative has to be trapped between negative 1 and 1. In class, I'm going to have you do this same sort of development on the board to figure out what the derivative of the tan in inverse is and to figure out what the derivative of the secant inverse is. So we'll save that for class time. We're going to end up with the stuff that's in the boxes. And then we're going to extend to old knowledge so that we can get the derivatives of the other inverse trig functions. So let's remember that acute angles in a right triangle are complementary. So if I write a right triangle here, I draw one, and I have alpha and beta as the acute angles, then we can see that the sine of alpha is x over 1, and the cosine of beta is x over 1. That means the inverse sine of x, or the angle whose sine is x, is alpha, and the angle whose cosine is x will be beta. And we know that alpha plus beta will be that 90 degrees, or pi over 2. So the cosine inverse of x and the sine inverse of x have to add up to give you pi over 2, or the cosine inverse of x will be pi over 2 minus the sine inverse. The same can be said for the relationships between cotangent inverse and tangent inverse, and the third one involving secant inverse and cosecant inverse. So what that means for us is that it makes it easy to take the derivatives of those remaining inverse trig functions. The derivative of the cosine inverse is going to be the same as the derivative of pi over 2 minus the derivative of the sine inverse. Well, derivative of a constant disappears, so we just get the opposite of that sine inverse's derivative. Same thing with cotangent inverse. Its derivative will be the opposite of the tangent inverse's derivative, and the derivative of the cosecant inverse will be the opposite of the secant inverse's derivative. So again, the cosines or the cofunctions that begin with those c's will be the opposites or the negatives of the cofunctions inverse derivatives. We have two examples that we can use to practice these derivatives of trig inverse functions, and we're going to crank up the difficulty of hair by using the chain rule in addition to those new rules that we have de developed. So if we look at this first example, we can see that I'm going to have to take a derivative of a sine inverse, and then I'm going to hit the derivative of a root, and then lastly, I will hit the derivative of an x squared minus 1. So I've got to keep track of those using chain rule. Then I'll move through the addition, and I'll hit the secant inverse. And then I'll move through the insides of that secant and hit the x squared. So we again are going to use that chain rule with our new inverse derivative or inverse trig function derivative rules. So to find dy dx, the first thing that we hit is the sine inverse. Well, the sine inverse rule is 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever's inside the sine inverse squared. 
once I have done that, because there was an inside that was more complicated than a simple x, I'm going to have to multiply by the derivative of that inside. So as I take the derivative of the inside, the first thing I hit is the root. So I'll apply that power rule. I've now taken care of the root, but I need to multiply the root by the derivative of what was inside the root. So the last thing I hit is that x squared minus 1. Then I'm finished with the first term. I'm ready to go through the addition, and now I hit the secant inverse. Well, the derivative of secant inverses are 1 over the absolute value of what's inside times the square root of what's inside squared minus 1. So we look at the inside, which is x squared, and that goes in both of these placeholders. And because the inside was something more complicated than a mere x, we're going to have to multiply by the derivative of that inside function. Because the goal of this section is to take derivatives, I'm not going to make you go much further than this for a free response. You'll have to practice some of it when we get to the multiple choice options, but they won't be quite as messy as this is. So we'll just stop right here and move to example two. Example two, same process. We want to practice taking that derivative, and we're going to see here that I hit the cotangent inverse first, and the cotangent inverse has something in it, so I'll have to apply the chain rule. Then I'll move through the negative, then I'll hit the tangent inverse, which also has something in it. So I'm going to have the chain rule applied in both of these terms. When I hit the cotangent, it starts with a c, so the derivative of cotangent is the opposite of the derivative of the tangent inverse. So the tangent inverse's derivative is 1 over 1 plus that inside squared. So the cotangent will be the opposite of the 1 over the 1 plus the inside squared. And because the inside was not just a plain x, we have to multiply by the derivative of that inside. Well, that's an x to the negative 1, whose derivative is a negative 1, x to the negative 2. Now we're done. We've run through both of those, so now we hit the minus. The tangent inverse's rule is 1 over 1 plus the inside squared times the derivative of that inside, which is a 3. So again, we'll leave the simplification to the notes web exam problems. Right now we're just practicing applying the rules with embedded composed functions. So I'd like you to try your notes web exam problems, identify the ones you need help with, and then write a memory trick to help you remember the derivatives of these inverse trig functions.